Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kick Saga. This is a video series where I interview a first-time self-publisher who's hoping to bring their tabletop game to life on crowdfunding. Um, so we're going to dig into the details uh, behind the scenes of what it really takes to make a board game and bring it to life in this day and age. Uh, what's unique about this series is that we interview the creator both before they're right before they're getting ready to launch on crowdfunding and then follow up with them right afterwards so that we can learn about what they did to prepare and then uh, follow up with them to see how things panned out, what they learned from the whole process, hopefully to get a holistic picture about uh, how the whole journey through the crowdfunding world works. And I'm very excited today to have Dickie Chapin on the show. He is founder of Frown Clowns. And uh, the game that he is uh, looking to bring to life soon here is called Joystick Heroes. Um, I've had a chance to play test it. It's a lot of fun. Um, hey, Dickie, how you doing? Thanks for being here. I'm good, Matt. How are you? I'm Thanks excellent. For me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, here. no problem. Uh, good, to, good to chat with you here. Um, I've uh, been enjoying uh, following your campaign so far. Uh, love what you've been putting out. And so I'm excited to kind of dig in to, to see uh, what you've been doing behind the scenes. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed testing your games as well. It's been fun. Uh, this little community we've established, uh, it's, a, it's a great resource. It's great for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, before we kind of dig into it, um, off the bat, you know, it, it's kind of all led up to this, right? Uh, all, mm -hmm. all the work and, and all the all the um, this blood, sweat and tears, as they say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. <laughs> I have been since since I made the decision to start this uh, whole crowdfunding thing. Uh, you know, this as I'm sure everybody in this series has told you, it's it's uh, a lot of work and it's a lot of uh, mystery and unsure. You know, unsurety if that's a word. Right. Uh, so yeah, launching into this whole thing is is um, is a challenge. Yeah. Even with all the resources that are out there and, you know, all the kind of transparency in the industry and people, you know, talking about what it really takes to, to launch something, it still it does feel like there's a lot of mystery behind it. And there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, just not sure of, of what to expect. Yeah. I mean, everything you read on the internet is, is information from the internet, right? So you don't know what's, the best advice and what is not so good advice, how outdated it might be, um, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of resources out there for sure, and most of it is is legitimate and good. Um, I highly recommend Jamie Stegmeier's uh, series. He's got great information. I very early on I read all that, but I think the problem for me is that, and and for most creators doing this, that these uh, these projects are our babies, you know, and we want to really make sure that we that we put our best foot forward in the, throughout this process. And there's so much work that needs to be done and so many things that you can kind of get wrong. So yeah, um, yeah gathering all the information you can uh, from, from uh, Facebook groups, from communities, from information you can find on the internet, it's just, uh, it's, it's uh, very crucial, I think. The thing that kind of is, is the mystery to me is when I'm following Kickstarters and stuff, sometimes I'll see a game that looks awesome that, that I love and that I'll back and I'm looking forward to. And then for whatever reason, it doesn't fund and yeah. I'm not sure why. And then in the same token, you see games that I'm like, I, you know, I, the artwork looks terrible and I have no idea, you know, why anyone would like this. And it ends up, you know, blowing up and people loving it. Yeah. And sometimes it's just hard to like put your finger on exactly why that happens. I totally agree. And, uh, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with what's going on behind the scenes, you know, under the hood, how, yeah. how those campaigns have, handled their advertising and marketing and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, you know, I personally am a graphic designer, so I, I spend a lot of time um, trying to make things look good. And uh, as you just said, sometimes that's not the whole, uh, the whole pie, you know, you have to do a lot of different things. Right. And it feels like, you know, all of the pieces of the pie need to be well baked, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> however you'd put it. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, um, before we kind of dig into the, the details there, uh, just for context, why don't you tell us a bit about the game you're looking to, uh, launch what it's called and, and kind of a little bit about how it plays and, and the, the story behind it. Sure. Uh, Joystick Heroes is, uh, the, the board game about playing video games. 
And you're basically a, an 80s teenager going into the arcade, um, spending tokens to play video games. And uh, you're trying to, earn, trying to earn tickets in order to level up your skills, your joystick, buttons, shooting, uh, and um, uh, what's the one I forgot? Joystick, buttons, shooting, and driving. That's it. <laughs> I don't know my own game. Um, <laughs> So yeah, you're trying to level up those skills uh, by spending tickets. You can also spend tickets to earn prizes. The player with the most prizes at the end of the game, uh, when everybody runs out of tokens, is the winner. And it's a light family weight dice chucker uh, with some uh, dice mitigation through card play and things like that. So uh, very easy for kids to learn. I'm hoping that it's also fun for their parents to play since it's kind of 80s retro based, maybe harkens back to your arcade days when you're a kid or 80s and 90s. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. It's very simple, easy to learn, colorful, light, and uh, hopefully a lot of fun. I, lo- I love the, um, yeah, the kind of the retro 80s feel. And it's funny as a child of the 80s to say retro when we I thought know. retro meant, you know, like 60s and 50s and stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Everybody's, <laughs> now- got their own, everybody's got their own definition of retro based on how old they are. Right, <laughs> um, but it definitely uh, it, I, I love the 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 theme and and how it harkens back to those days of going to an arcade and with a bag of quarters and and just spending the whole day you know uh, playing playing arcade games and and you don't really have that too too much these days. I mean, there's Dave and yeah. Buster's and stuff. I I think is is kind of the the closest thing that, that keeps that going. And yeah. every now and then that you find a neighborhood where they have a local arcade that's that's still chugging along, but it's definitely yeah. rare these days. Uh, I used to love it. My parents used to drive me to the, uh, take me to the mall, and instead of shopping, they would just give me a, some quarters and say, "Okay, go to the arcade," and I'd spend all my time there. And I'm I'm actually lucky because I live near a place called Golf and Stuff here in uh, Southern California, mm-hmm. which is actually the arcade and entertainment area where they filmed the date scene in Karate Kid. Oh. So it's it's still a, a functioning uh. arcade and and mini golf place. So it's. I've actually uh, gone there a couple times just for inspiration on this game. It's it's uh, it was a good resource. Sweet. Um, so, cu- what kind of uh, got you interested in launching your own game and getting you know wrapped up in this crazy world of game game design and publishing? Well, as as an only child, when I was uh, little, I used to make my own games that I could play uh, with myself. You know, me versus me. And I started making sports games and I started making other games. And, uh, you know, when you get older and lose interest in that kind of thing, um, fast forward to a lot of years later, uh, I ran across the Game Crafter and Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, there's a resource I can actually make professional looking games that I can play, uh, both games that I created as a kid and, and new ones. I can play these with my kids, you know, um, nice. and I was just really interested in, in making a nice looking thing that I could play with my kids. I, I wasn't even thinking, oh, I'm going to turn this into a career or a money making thing or anything like that. And I still kind of think that way. I still, um, you know, when I create a game, I'm not out to make money off of it. I just want to make something cool that I can play with my kids. And if, you know, if it uh, expands beyond that, then awesome. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of the attitude you you have to have these days, right, with you know, you hear the horror stories of publishers going out of business with shipping yeah. the way it is and, and all the, the money that you have to invest in a game. Um, it really has to be a passion project and really kind of approached, you know, as, you know, if you don't make any money from it, if it just ends up being like a cool hobby that you end up breaking even on, um, that, that should be good enough <laughs> because yeah. it's nothing else is guaranteed in this world. Absolutely. Um, I think that goes to, that's the same for most um, creative projects, you know, you have to be passionate about it and you have to Very not true. rely on it, you know, as your career, uh, in order to enjoy it. In fact, I think if you do rely on, uh, rely on it for your career, that kind of takes some of the fun out of it. <laughs> so part of, um, you know, the, uh, designing a game is the decision to whether you're going to try to pitch it to a publisher or try to publish it yourself. Um, you're going the self-publishing route. Uh, did you ever consider trying to pitch it first? Did you try that at first? Or were you kind of all in on the uh, publisher model? You know, um, I own uh, another business, a, so- a music software business. And uh, after working for several years for other companies that were that was in, uh, that are involved in that industry, I kind of branched out on my own because I thought, you know, I want to do this my way. I want to make all the creative decisions and things like that. 
And um, that's kind of how I've approached making games as well. I'm not opposed to pub pitching to publishers, but for this first one, I kind of wanted to try to DIY and you know follow that theme. Um, I'll let you know later whether or not that was a smart decision. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Tune in for part two. Yeah. We uh, we learn if that was a smart decision. Yeah, but I'm definitely um, open to yeah. other solutions. You know, with other games, I've, I'm thinking of pitching to publishers and thinking of using, for example, even the the game crafters crowd sale option for a smaller game. Maybe that might be a good option. You know, just cards only. Um, so right. yeah, it's all the above. There there are lots of options these days, right? And lots of kind of hybrid models that you can you can choose from whether it's you know not necessarily pitching to a publisher but maybe partnering with an established publisher i see lots of first game first time game creators partnering with publishers to distribute you know globally or get their game out you know further and have it reach further than it would typically yeah. um i know like uh flat out games is a good example of of a of a studio that just designs games and then partners with publishers to get the publishing done. And, and so there's lots of different models and lots of different ways to go about it and keeping your, your mind open to all those, those possibilities. Um, I think is smart. Yeah, uh, for sure. So let, let's, um, let's look at kind of who, who you worked with to bring this to life. You talked about you, uh, you know, you're a graphic designer, so you bring those skills to the table. And so luckily that's one, you know, kind of, uh, part of the development process that you don't necessarily need to, to outsource or find someone to, to do. Yeah. Um, but of course you can't do everything. Right. So I'm curious, you know, who, who, uh, who you've partnered with or where you've found help and, and kind of what, what uh, team you've leveraged to bring this to life. Sure. Um, well, I, I do work with a design partner uh, named uh, David Smith at frown clowns. He's the other half of the other clown in the frown clowns <laughs> logo. Um, and he's been awesome in, in helping me with tech stuff, coding for, for the tabletop simulator um, yeah. version and, and things like that. So I'll always run ideas past him and play test with him first before bringing it to other play testers. So he's, a, he's my partner in this whole thing. Uh, apart from that, I worked with a great illustrator on Joystick Heroes named James Churchill. He's a, an Australian dude who's worked on a whole bunch of games. Awesome illustrator. Yeah. Um, I actually got some help from some Fiverr uh, designers for for basic nice. iconography and things like that, um, and ha happened to have some good luck there. Uh, for marketing, I actually approached uh, a new company, and I think it's called, they're going to kill me if I get this wrong, but I think it's mm -hmm. called um, Kick Restarter or something like that. And it, it, anyway, it's a company uh, run by Joe Slack, who's another game designer. And uh, Ori Kagan of Kagan Productions, who's a fantastic videographer. I'm sure you've seen a lot of his work on, on trailers. Uh, and uh, Dina Ramsey, who is a social media guru. So they, they put together a little team to kind of help first time uh, Kickstarters and even teams, uh, even people who are trying to restart their Kickstarter project after mm -hmm. a failed project and uh, kind of get them going in the right direction. Uh, they've got a lot of experience and um, they really, Kind of laid out a, a great roadmap for me to to try to follow, and I'm actually still working with them, um, regular meetings and things like that. Got an advertising agency trying to help me out. So uh, again, I'm I'm trying to cover all the bases um, to make sure I don't screw this up somehow. <laughs> <laughs> right, just kind of try to you know cover as many bases as possible and and work with folks who who have done this before and, and know what they're yeah. talking about. So yeah. speaking of that that roadmap for Kickstarter, um, you know, has there has there been any part of that process working with that team um, where you were surprised uh, about like what it takes or what you needed um, to to bring it to life or kind of any nuggets that, that you could share about that? Yeah, two things um, come to mind immediately. First of all, I don't see how anyone who is running a Kickstarter who is not a graphic designer can do this. I mean, it's it, there are so many graphics that you need in both your your campaign page, advertising, uh, just uh, every day I'm having to pump out three or four new um, new images, you know, that, wow. that are required for this. And it's just a ton of work. I, I just can't imagine if I didn't, I didn't have, if I didn't have those skills, I would be relying on other people and it would just take so much more time and effort and money, obviously. So um, that part of it, I, I wasn't really aware of until now. Um, the other part of it is this is just establishing social media presence and 
establishing a presence in the game community. I'm fairly new to the community. So, you know, working with Dina has been very valuable. Just uh, basic things like how to post uh, for optimal engagement in social media, you know, rather than just go to a, a Facebook gaming group and say, hey, everybody, here's my game. Come check it out. Click the link. You know, you, you, you have to be more strategic about it and be like, uh, hey, guys, here's a picture of my dice. Uh, what do you think of these? And what are your favorite dice games? You know, and, you, and just things to start the conversation, which I'm uh, these are just extra hats that, you know, when I got into game design, I never anticipated wearing those hats. Um, right. But, you know, it's it's a, a real learning experience and I'm I still don't have it right. But <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it all works out. As long as you're learning, right? You're yeah. Learning, I, you know, if I, just, the process. if I ever decide to do this again, I'll, I'll have a lot more, you know, I'll have a, a head start. Cool. So let's kind of focus in on the on the Kickstarter page itself. Um, what were some of the things you focused on in putting together the page, some of the information that you're trying to get across? And I you know there are lessons you've learned as you're putting together the content of your Kickstarter page specifically. Yeah. Um, again, as a graphic designer, it's been a, a great help to to be able to try different things. Um, I basically just went to some Kickstarter projects that that I thought looked great and looked at the flow of the page, uh, which graphics came first, whether or not it's the pledge levels or basic description or um, you know what's in the box, things like that. And I just looked at how other other successful campaigns had had compiled their page and how they put together the graphics and kind of um, came up with my own uh, hybrid model from those. Uh, also used some advice from Joe Slack's team. So yeah, it's just, again, I'm just trying to soak in as much information as I can to make sure this works. Right. And uh, it, the page looks great. Uh, you also have a, a very, um, I, I think, a very entertaining and engaging video. Um, so what was the process of putting together the video? Um, and how involved were you in that? Did you kind of offload all of it to someone? Or did you have a, a part of that process? Walk us through that whole thing. Yeah, that, that whole process was a pleasure because I worked with uh, David Diaz at um, Mesa Game Lab. And he was a fantastic, uh, he's just a fantastic videographer. Um, I talked to three different videographers, uh, George, uh, Ori, uh, Kagan Productions, and they're, they're all fantastic. And I just had to basically draw a name out of a hat because they, they, <laughs> they do such great work. Um, but I, I lucked out with David. He, he uh, was fantastic the whole way. And uh, so as far as what was involved in it, um, I kind of came up with the script myself. And that was a big help for David and, and came up with the pacing and said, you know, OK, 14 seconds, let's do this at 17 seconds. Let's switch to this. And I think nice. that was a lot of help for him. Uh, gave him some art direction as far as it being like a like an 80s. My idea was to make it like an 80s toy commercial with the kind of VHS lines happening and fuzz and little noise and things like that. Um, I also did the music for it and I also did the voiceover. And so if you hear me talk now and you, you see the video later, you'll, you'll realize why I pretty much threw my back out trying to do that uh, voiceover. <laughs> right. It doesn't it's, sound it's, like, like it's you little, now. <laughs> it's a little wild. So um, yeah. it was a fun process. And uh, after I did the audio and, and gave David the script uh, and, the, and obviously the component designs, he just took it and ran with it. And really the first draft I got back from him, I was absolutely blown away. I was, you, wow. she's just absolutely nailed it. So yeah, it was a, it was a great, uh, a great collaboration. And it's great that you're leveraging um, your talents as a musician and, and with voiceover and, and all of that stuff. So, uh, and I, I love to see creators doing that no matter what they're good at, whether it's the marketing, whether it's the graphics, whether, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, putting a piece of them in the project and being as involved as possible, I think always, it seems to me at least, ends up helping the project stand out and be unique. And, and so that's definitely, I think the case with this one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's our baby, right? So we want to, we want to have kind of a say in every part of the process to make sure, right. uh, make sure it's, it follows our vision. Um, okay. So the other kind of part of, of launching a campaign, I think is getting um, like previews and reviews from um, folks, you know, who do those types of things. How did you approach that? Um, who did you find to to take a look at the game? How many prototypes did you send out? Uh, kind of yeah. talk, uh, walk us through that process. Sure, uh, I was uh, I kind of got the, the a jump start on finding a manufacturer 
and I've already decided on the manufacturer and I, I got my prototypes made directly through them uh, and shipped to me a couple months ago. I only had seven made because they're quite expensive as mm -hmm. a one-off. Um, they, they're, I think just to give you some kind I think they were like $170 a piece to make. Wow. Um, yeah. and, uh, they came out great. No complaints there at all. I got those cool. seven copies and along with some advice and guidance from Joe and Dina and that team, I chose, uh, seven different content creators that I thought were, I uh, had, uh, put out great product, you know, did a great job of, of making their videos for a professional quality also had decent subscriber lists and things like that. And also people that I'd been following on YouTube uh, for a while and I really enjoy their videos. So yeah, um, sent those prototypes out to them and I've got four of them back so far and still waiting on the last couple. And cool. uh, th again, there's this community is filled with awesome people and they're, they've been just really easy to work with and, um, you know, some of them send you a script and say, okay, this is what I'm planning on going through. Do I, do I have oh, nice. the game right? Do I have the rules correct? Um, and they allow me the opportunity to give them some uh, edits and feedback, which has been great. Um, you know, I have to, I have to say Mark Street from the Dice Tower actually uh, met me on, on Tabletop Simulator one day and said, let's go through the game. Let's, let's talk about this. And nice. um, he actually played the game with his family and, uh, you know, again, it, Every every content creator has a kind of a different way of of making us happy, and it's it's been it's been awesome. Yeah, that, I, I found it every every turn in this community. You find people who are just go out of their way to um, to to help and and be you know a pleasure to work with, and I find that to be the um, the rule, not the exception. Definitely um, for the for the most part. So yeah, it's yeah. that that's been, been the one kind of big surprising takeaway from this whole journey so far is just, you know, how many great welcoming, open, um, nice people there are in this community. Yeah. I liken it to, to when you first tried playing golf. Um, you know, everybody's, everybody started out as a, as a beginner and everybody mm -hmm. sucked really bad at the beginning. So, um, there's nobody on the golf course that's going to be impatient. Uh, if you hit one into the water, you know, they're all like, okay, I've been there. So it's a, the gaming community is exactly the same. You know, they've, they started out as game designers. They started out somewhere just like we are. Right. So, um, yeah, very compassionate and, and helpful. So, um, looking at the, the, the cost and the pricing, how you're pricing your game, um, what kind of different pledge levels you're going to have on the Kickstarter, that sort of thing. How did you approach that? How did you figure out what the final pledge level cost is going to be? Um, yeah. So, um, as far as the price of the game, I didn't have, I didn't factor in, uh, the cost of manufacturing the game at all. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously I want to get a good price from the manufacturer, but, uh, I just really want to get the game out there. So I'm not, I'm not concerned on this first Kickstarter, uh, or maybe future ones who, who knows, but I'm not concerned with making money. I just want to get it out there. I want, I, I really want to show my kids that I made something and this is how you can do this and you can make this happen. Nice. So, um, I, I just kind of set the price at whatever I thought I would pay for it. Mm. You know, if I saw this in a store, um, so yeah, this, there wasn't any complicated calculation there where a lot of people say, you know, I have to do seven, seven times the cost of manufacturing for copy. And I'm just like, right. I thought about that for a while. And I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know that, that, that would make it too expensive in my opinion. So I just thought. I went to Target or Walmart and saw this on the shelf, saw the components that came with it. What would I pay? And then, so with that in mind, then what did, how did you kind of decide to set for the funding goal for your Kickstarter? I set it really low because I just want to make it happen. Um, okay. uh, the, the goal that I set doesn't cover all of the costs of this campaign. Um, it might cover manufacturing. It's not going to cover shipping to get the games over here. It's not going to cover um, uh, marketing, advertising, uh, all the costs involved in paying illustrators, things like that. You know, it's it just right. doesn't come close. Um, but that's okay. Again, I, I'm I'm not doing this to make money. I want to get it out there. Yeah, I think as long as you're um, realistic with that and you you go in knowing that, um, then it you know 
then you're you're well set, right? Then you know what's coming, and um, yeah. I think you you run into trouble when you know you set all the all the funding goal low, and and you set the game price low, and then you still expect to to make a ton of money from it. Yeah, um, sure. And, and I know a lot uh, of people do that. Uh, um, it can be a shock. Yeah, uh, I've seen astronomical funding goals, and I've seen um, you know two hundred dollar funding goals, and you know everybody's got their own reasons. Um, but again, I just want to see it happen. Nice. Um, so, you know, what have you done to kind of drum up uh, interest in the game? Um, any uh, and kind of build a following or an audience? Any any tips you can share with the the viewers? That's that's the hat that I was most worried about wearing for this whole process because I'm not I'm I'm not a salesperson um, and I don't spend a ton of time on social media. So uh, that's been a learning experience, and I'm still trying to figure it all out. Again, right. that's why I hired. Uh, Dina and her team to try to help me through that process. Right. Uh, a lot of it still there's there's no company out there that you can hire to do all this for you, right? Uh, and trust me, I researched it. I was like, you know what? I just mm -hmm. want to be the game designer. I want to hire somebody else to quarterback the whole project, help me with my social media, build followings, etc. There's nobody right. to do that. To do that. So I mean, that would be a publisher, right? That would be just uh, so many times I've, I've, I've asked that question, and some people are like. Okay, so you want a publisher then? So you, that's what you, <laughs> yeah. So you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, the biggest challenge for me has been the social media part of it, and just trying to de develop the uh, followings through grassroots approach, and just posting cleverly and you know engaging people in conversations. Um, still, I, I'm still not very good at that. But you know, joining good playtesting groups. Um, asking for feedback, uh, letting a lot of people test it and maybe get excited about it. Uh, that's been very valuable. Uh, and again, I don't know what, how good of a job I'm doing at it. So we'll see uh, later. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you can only do so much and then just hope that it, uh, it gains kind of the momentum that you hope for. You, you get a lot of eyeballs on it. You get people playing it. They like it. They talk about it. Um, exactly. Thank you that's the best you can do. Right. And, and that's the best you can hope for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll see how, how good I was at it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so, you know, uh, feel free to be as specific uh, with your answer to this question as you would like. Um, but, you know, however you want to share it, what would you say is kind of the total investment, uh, monetary investment you would have put into this game before, you know, leading up to the Kickstarter? just to kind of give other folks who might be thinking about this an idea of what it might take them to do the same thing. Sure. So, so how much have I spent so far basically? Yep. Okay. Um, well, uh, for the production, for the design of the game, I'm talking illustration, things like that. There, the, there are those costs, advertising, um, uh, content creator, you have to pay them obviously to make good videos for you. Uh, I, I actually calculated, calculated this the other day because I was curious about it myself, mm. not counting all of my time, which, you know, you have to put a value on, but you can't really because it's your, it's yeah. your passion project. It's your baby. <clears throat> I would say I've put maybe $22,000, something like that. And that's not yeah. counting upcoming advertising um, right. bills that I, I'm starting to get. <laughs> and of course, yeah. manufacturing and all of that. Um, manufacturing is, is on top of this yeah so part of that that isn't covered by whatever you earn on kickstarter yeah um yeah so i i think that that sounds about in line with you know what what uh, i've heard from other folks that it takes to to bring this to life and you're even you know taking care of some of the graphic design stuff yourself so you know for other folks who aren't able to do that that would yeah. uh, not include that as well again i can't imagine um people having to outsource that it's just so much work to do yeah yep um, all right, so let's uh, let's jump into the numbers. Um, if if you uh, if you have these handy, um, what uh, you know? How many folks would you say are currently following your Kickstarter page? Uh, right now, there are only around four hundred and twenty-five on the Kickstarter page, and then I've got a backer kit pre-launch page set up that has one hundred and twenty. So all in all, that's five around five hundred and fifty. Um, we have a, a, nice. a lot of advertising going out this week and uh, hopefully trying to get that number up over 600. I've heard uh, from Dina and her team that anywhere between 600 and 3000 is where you want to be at. 
<laughs> wow, that's a big range. Before you launch, <laughs> it, it's a huge range. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, we had a little bit of a hiccup with our advertising uh, last month to put us behind schedule a little bit. But, you know, again, uh, that's one of the reasons I set my funding goal so low. I just want to make this happen. Uh, right. I want to get it out there to people and hopefully see other people having fun with it. Um, so, and the 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 backer kit um, website, um, the the that kind of is funneling into like a, a email list or a newsletter. Correct. Yeah, that's that's okay. going to actually give us the emails. Um, whereas uh, I don't know if people know this, but when you have people sign up for your campaign uh, pre-launch notification on Kickstarter, you do not get those emails. Right. So um, that's one reason to go with a, a something like a backer kit. A pre-launch page or something like that or mailchimp or whatever you want to do it through yeah um, but uh, yeah, that's cool that it's through backer kit because that's going to end up I, I assume being your pledge manager as well exactly yeah yeah so so everything will just funnel straight in there hopefully that'll make it a, a less painful process right. um but yeah I, at some point you know at the beginning of the process we were having everybody go through and sign up through the pre-launch backer kit page but i think it wasn't um, it wasn't familiar to people, mm. as familiar as a Kickstarter uh, notification page. So we weren't getting as, as many signups there. Uh, so we at, at some point, we pivoted and just had everybody directed to the Kickstarter page. And that's when those numbers started going up much better. Yeah, I guess it's a trade-off, right? Because you're not getting those emails, yeah. but you're getting more you know, uh, clicks, at least. On exactly, the, on the and more followers. Side. And that's you know, it's, it's all about followers at this point. Right. Um, have you done anything on Board Game Geek? Set up a page there. Tried to engage with anyone on on that side. I did. Um, again, that the whole engagement thing is not my forte. So, you know, you you obviously should set up a Board Game Geek page for yourself, for your um, your little publishing company, for yourself as a game designer, for uh, hopefully your illustrators and everybody you're working with has their own page, so they can all be interlinked. Um, but I found the I found the board game geek page a little difficult to work with because mm -hmm. you can't simply post things about your own game, right? You can't say, okay, here's some pictures, make them appear on the front page, or here's a link to my website. You know, it's, it it all has to be uh, populated by other users. Um, Interesting. That's the best way to, for it to be done. And mm -hmm. so I found that a little frustrating, uh, and it's still not probably fleshed out as much as it should be. For that reason. Yeah, I guess because um, Board Game Geek is really meant for a place for board game fans to go and enter information about the games they love. Not necessarily. I, th I don't think it was ever meant for a place for publishers to go to like advertise their game exactly. and, and put it up there. So it is kind of a weird. Uh, yeah, so weird I mean, system. nobody's going to know about the game at all. Nobody's going to go and create your page for you. So you at least have right. to do that part, and then just yeah. kind of hope people start to interact with it. Yeah, cool. Well, um, I, I think that's that's about all I have for you. Um, lots of great information, lots of good resources shared, uh, and we look forward to uh, following up with you in uh, in about a month to see how the campaign went. Uh, I wish you all the best. You've uh, put together a great campaign. It looks awesome. Um, Thank you. And uh, I look forward to uh, following along. Any final uh, parting words of wisdom or anything you want to leave um, our, our viewers with? Well, first of all, thanks, Matt, for having me uh, on this series. It's It's been fun to see some of the other episodes, too. It's a very helpful series. I appreciate you having me. And, uh, I mean, words of wisdom, uh, don't do this unless you're absolutely ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's hard work. Uh, we'll see how it pays off. Cool. And uh, if you guys want to follow along with the Joystick Heroes or um, uh, follow any of the other, hopefully, future games that uh, Frown Clowns puts out, um, I know they're working on uh, a game that's very close to my heart uh, <laughs> that's that's based around music and bands and stuff. And so I, I hope that uh, that eventually gets out as well. So if you want to follow any of these games or wh what they're up to, we'll have links below this video um, where you can uh, check out their stuff. Uh, thanks again, Dickie, for being on the show. And uh, for those of you who want to, um, you know, see how this campaign uh, uh, turns out, definitely uh, be sure to subscribe to this uh, channel so that you can get notified when we do the follow-up interview and you can see all of the future videos we do in this series. Uh, but for now, I'm Matthew Rodella. This has been Kick Saga, and we'll see you in part two.